Good evening. My name is Jane Long. I'm Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor at La Trobe University. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we gathered this evening and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event entitled, provocatively, Fear and Greed, Australia-China Relations. And it's a collaboration between La Trobe Asia and Ideas and Society. And I'm also very pleased to welcome our audience who are joining us via live webcast this evening in Mildura and elsewhere. Tonight's panel brings together an array of very prominent speakers and we're indeed fortunate and privileged to have them in the same place and this, at the same time. Tonight's proceedings will be chaired by Professor Nick Bisley, the Executive Director of La Trobe Asia. My only happy task this evening, therefore, is to encourage you to enjoy, react, respond, probe and question the panel during the Q&A. So I'd like now to hand over to my colleague, Nick, who will introduce the panel members, explain the format and who will chair tonight's proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, let me also welcome you and express my great pleasure in welcoming you to our Fear and Greed panel uh, discussing the state and future direction of the Australia-China relationship. My name is Nick Bisley and I'm the Executive Director of Latrobe Asia. Uh, as Jane said, tonight's program has been a joint effort of my team and Professor Robert Mann's Ideas and Society program. Uh, as Jane said, um, La Trobe is a regional university with four campuses based outside metropolitan Melbourne and tonight Dr. Dr. Deb Neal is hosting members of the university community in Mildura to watch the live web stream of the discussion at our campus in northwestern Victoria. So I shall channel my inner Eurovision and say good evening Mildura. Um, and of course through, through the miracle of mobile technology um, they will have the opportunity to engage in the Q&A as you do uh, here in Melbourne. One of the few areas in which Tony Abbott was thought to have played a good hand as Prime Minister was in international affairs. The mismanagement, gaffes and captain's picks were principally confined to the domestic sphere, biting into onions, knighthoods for Greco-British aristocrats and at times unvarnished sexism was something that rarely interfered with foreign affairs. Even the odd statement that he would shirt front Russia's authoritarian president Vladimir Putin at the G20 was pitched to local media and was of little policy consequence. But the former Prime Minister did have one slip of the tongue on the international stage that had the potential to do considerable damage to the country's interests. During a visit to Sydney linked to the G20 summit, German Chancellor Angela Merkel asked him what drove Australia's relations with China, and Abbott showed his journalist instincts, swiftly replying that it was fear and greed. No bromides about friendship, shared futures, and never having to choose between Beijing and Washington. At the highest level, Australia's approach to the world's most populous country was driven by base emotion. Now, diplomacy is normally couched in antiseptic and often oblique terms because of concerns about the consequences of sharp and honest language on the atmospherics of a relationship. Abbott showed with remarkable directness how Australians were torn between the opportunities and risks which China presents, as well as the visceral nature of our reaction to this country's remarkable return to power. The purpose of today's panel is to bring together four of Australia's preeminent experts on China to explore what animates the Australia-China relationship, to ask whether the Prime Minister was right in this characterisation, and to think through alternative ways of thinking about and approaching this complex, fraught, but hugely important relationship for Australia. Um, we're extremely pleased to have such an outstanding panel to lead our discussion, and I will briefly introduce them, and they will then speak for about seven to eight minutes each in the order I introduce them and then we'll have a moderated Q&A session. I will police their time in the same way that Xi Jinping has pursued his tigers and flies to ensure that we have plenty of time for discussion. Starting on my far right, although that says nothing about her politics, Linda Jakobsen is the founding director of China Matters, a not-for-policy, uh, sorry, not-for-policy, not-for-profit policy organisation focused on the Australia-China relationship. It's, it is entirely about policy. Uh, she is also a visiting professor at the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney and a member of the Latrobe Asia Advisory Board. On my immediate right, John Lee is a non-resident senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington DC 
and an adjunct associate professor at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the Australian National University. To my left, uh, Jeff Raby was Australia's ambassador to China between 2011, and he is now the CEO of Jeff Raby and Associates, a Beijing-based business advisory firm. He's also a member of the Latrobe Asia Advisory Board. As you can see, we like to sweat the assets at Latrobe. And perhaps most importantly, is an alumnus of Latrobe University with not one, but three economics degrees at the undergraduate, masters, and doctoral level. Finally, but by no means least, uh, Bob Carr is the director of the Australia-China Relations Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney. He was Australia's foreign minister between March 2012 and September 2013, and was the longest continually, continuously serving premier of New South Wales. That's our panel. I will now turn straight to Linda, and we'll, they will speak in order. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Nick, and uh, thank you uh, to Nick, his team, to La Trobe Asia for inviting me, for organizing this panel. I think it's a terrific idea. Um, Nick has asked me to lead off with a few thoughts about security in the realm of this fear and greed. I better say um, from the start that when I saw the title, I didn't like it. Um, I was pretty astonished when um, the then Prime Minister Abbott um, said it, or it came out in public that he had said it. I don't think fear and greed is any basis for thinking about Australia-China relations. But I'm going to be true to the task that has been given to me and um, come up with three factors when we think of alternative ways to think about fear. Obviously, when I'm talking about security, um, I'm not going to talk so much about greed. I'm going to be talking about fear. Um, the obvious has to be said. Um, China is so big, um, it should be feared for that reason. I was reminded of this yesterday, not yesterday, sorry, on Friday, I was in Canberra in a department which very rarely deals with China, and all the rather senior level officials said to me, oh, China's so big, when they come here, we don't really know what to do with them. That astounded me. Of course, China's so different, uh, one's always a bit unsure, fearful of what um, one doesn't know, and that brings me to my first point about fear, the uncertainty of China. Um, the uncertainty of how China is going to use its power. I think that is one factor that all of us in the region, not only Australia, has to take into account when thinking of how to deal with China, um, this very rapidly rising power. Um, I'd like to add to that that the Chinese themselves don't know how China, 20 years from now, is going to use its power. And of course that complicates matters. What makes it even more complex is um, the uncertainty of the top leadership of the Chinese Communist Party when they think of their own legitimacy. And I presume we're going to talk more about that um, in today's panel. I talk about the existential anxiety of the top leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, despite the fact that Xi Jinping is known as a strongman. Um, so that's the first fear, the fear of uncertainty. How will China use its power? The second uh, factor is, of course, a fear, understandably, all over the re region, that relations between the United States and China will somehow derail. Um, obviously, this would have a profound impact, or I should say probably a profoundly detrimental impact on the region, um, Australia included. Um, I think the media has had a heyday describing the possibility of an incident, uh, especially at sea or in the air, in um, the near waters of China, in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea. Um, I too fear an incident but I don't fear that an incident would spiral out of control in the way that we are made to believe, simply because I see the United States and China having a very mature relationship. I think we forget that when we think of all the tensions, the inherent distrust between the two countries. Um, they have over 90 official dialogues and consultations, nearly every single day of the year, except maybe Christmas Day and Chinese New Year Day. American and Chinese officials sit um, across the table from each other and learn how to live with each other. I think it's a mature relationship. I think we've seen that 
in a number of incidents in recent years how well uh, these two governments do know how to deal with each other in a crisis. Uh, then the third issue, the third factor, when we try and think of fear, what should we be afraid of as China rises and what should we be afraid of in the Australia-China relationship? And that's the fear of what will happen to the China-Japan relationship. Um, you'd think that this is a mature relationship. Two of the world's most ancient civilizations who have dealt with each other over the centuries, whose culture actually um, draws from each other's cultures. You'd think that this was a mature relationship, but it isn't. It's fraught with raw emotion. I call it a relationship of denial. Um, they deny each other's histories. They deny each other's um, political systems. They deny each other's greatness. And I could go on and on. A clash between China and Japan could indeed spiral out of control in a way that the leaders of the two countries wouldn't be able to manage it. This is one reason when we talk about Australia-China relations, I always say that Australia shouldn't put itself in a position where anyone would think that it is choosing over um, China over Japan or Japan over China, because that is the most fraught relationship in the re region um, at the end of the day. I think I'm approximately at the end of my time. I don't know. Um, I have two more minutes. Um, I, I, I'll repeat my concern when we talk about um, fear of um, China and Japan not knowing how to accommodate each other as um, China rises. Japan will remain a very important power in the region. And how will this region learn to live uh, with the two of them? I don't see the United States-China relationship as the one to fear. I'll end there. All right, thank you, Nick. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this panel, and thank you all for um, um, taking the time to be here. Now, I guess when you ask a question about greed or fear, um, in my view, the way I've understood uh, what I'm being asked to talk about, um, you're really asking whether what we're seeking to gain from China is somehow reckless or irresponsible. And when you talk about fear, I think you're really asking the question uh, whether the anxieties that we have about China's rise is based on ignorance or some sort of uh, irrationality. Uh, my argument, in short, is that it is none of these things. Um, there are some prominent Australians, I think, that overreach on a greed or fear uh, levels in, in the public discussion, uh, but I think characterising uh, the Australian relationship as driven by greed and fear, uh, it's unhelpful, but worse than that, it's just not uh, very accurate. Uh, let me first begin with the charge that we're driven by greed or avarice or whatever word you want to use uh, when we deal with China. Now, I'm going to start with uh, something known as Sutton's Law, uh, which some of you might know. And Sutton's law basically says that if you want to understand the reason for something or you want to diagnose something and medical students use Sutton's law, you begin with the most obvious uh, thing. Now, for you philosophers out there, Occam's razor uh, is a similar uh, philosophy. Now, Sutton's law came or is derived from the famous uh, or infamous American bank robber, uh, Willie Sutton. He, over 40 years, robbed a series of banks from about the, the, the 1920s uh, to the 1950s. Uh, it's alleged that when he was finally in jail and someone asked him, a journalist asked him, why did you rob banks? Sutton simply replied, because that's where the money is. Now, it doesn't actually matter that this uh, interview is almost certainly apocryphal. It didn't really take place. Uh, the point is that when you talk about China, uh, you know, we focus on China simply because that is where the money is. That is where you make money when you conduct your trading relations. So uh, those seeking to make a buck um, are going to focus on China. I mean, that's just what Sutton's Law will tell you. And unless you happen to think that making a profit or open trade is particularly heinous or morally dubious activity, uh, then 
in our case, selling what we have, things from the ground, education, tourism, uh, what we're going to do is sell as much as we can of these things to the Chinese, and that's certainly what has been done, and we're certainly not alone in the world uh, in, in, in doing that. But if you still have your doubts about whether this is a, a justifiable activity, uh, then consider why uh, we should place less emphasis or economic emphasis on a country uh, that occupies one quarter of the landmass of the Asian continent uh, and on which uh, lives about one fifth of the world's population. And if you still think that we should somehow uh, not trade as much as we do with China, then ask yourself for what purpose uh, and why that's the case. Now, even if you don't like some of the way, some of the aspects of how China's rule, and, and I certainly do not like some aspects of how the Chinese Communist Party rules in China, uh, think what is a better alternative uh, beyond the Chinese Communist Party in the way that the country is constituted uh, at the moment? And would a decrease Australian economic emphasis on China really make for a uh, better outcome uh, in that country? Now, let me transition to a discussion of fear. Now, are we too afraid of China? Um, after all, China uh, has been a permanent uh, presence in Asia for uh, the last 5,000 uh, years. Unlike, for example, say America, um, who has only really been a great power in Asia since uh, after World War II. Now, those who say, uh, and, and of course there are those who say that, that China emerged um, out of isolation after the Mao Zedong years. It emerged in a regional and global environment. It had very little role in actually defining, in shaping. Uh, so why should China, for example, um, be content to exist under uh, the rules that um, it found itself in uh, when it began to uh, open its doors uh, to the outside world. But I think this is the problem that China is always going to face. Um, you may point to justifications of why China may be a discontented power, and you may say, therefore, why fear uh, the Chinese. But I think the problem is that China will always face the problem um, of its size and its geography, and let me tell you what I mean by that. Now, because of China's size, uh, everything that China does good, bad in the world, is going to have a deep and disproportionate consequence on countries around it uh, and, 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 and on countries uh, in the world. Now, this is the reason why great powers are watched more closely than smaller powers or middle powers, because they have a disproportionate effect on the countries around them. Uh, and because of China's geography, I mean, China is literally, physically, uh, the middle kingdom in, in the Asian continent, its actions is always going to have a disproportionate strategic effect uh, on its neighbours. So you take the disputes in the South China Sea as an, as an illustration. I think m many will correctly point out that the, the, the Philippines and Vietnam were building or reclaiming land features way before uh, what the Chinese were doing uh, and have been doing in the last 10 years. Uh, but China's recent activities are on a scale um, that is far beyond what the smaller Southeast Asian countries are able to do. And the point is that what China does just has more strategic consequences than what any other Asian country does. Hence, the fear of China, uh, which in, in, in that sense, I think, is an understandable uh, emotion. It's not an irrational uh, emotion, if you like. Now, add to this the prospect that China, which has been for centuries or thousands of years, in fact, um, a continental power, except for a few years in the Ming Dynasty, it is now becoming not just a continental power, but a naval power. Uh, there is justifiable and understandable apprehension in the region, uh, including from Australia. And when you talk about uh, strategic relations, uh, international relations, it's kind of like physics. Every action will have an opposite uh, reaction. And I think this is why you're seeing Australian and maritime powers uh, effectively um, doing anything they can uh, to ensure that America remains a permanent presence uh, in a region. Now, finally, let me, uh, in the last minute, just throw out a few principles uh, that I think should guide future uh, Australian policy with China, and in discussion, I'm happy to say why I think this is the case. Now, one, in my view, um, the outside world has a pretty limited uh, capacity to shape how Chinese leaders think and how they see their place in the world. 
Now, I think great powers in concert with other countries, like Australia, can offer collective carrots and sticks uh, to try to manage or in some ways regulate Chinese behaviour. But China will basically determine its own destiny, the shape of its political economy, the shape of its politics, the shape of its economy. Uh, there is not so much that we can actually do about it. This leads to my second principle, that uh, you, you've heard it some, uh, in, in Australian debate at times, but I think Australia should resist what I'd see as the vanity or the conceit of uh, seeing ourselves as being in a role to play a role of a bridge, uh, particularly between uh, America and China. Uh, I think if we do that, we'll end up failing and we'll just end up annoying a pretty important ally and a pretty important uh, economic power. And finally, uh, I don't think we can try to predict or preempt the future uh, when it comes to forming policies based on China. I mean, China's not going to continue growing forever at, at the pace that it has been. What happens after that, we're not quite sure. China is probably going to end up as, in some senses, a strong and rich state, but still uh, a, uh, sorry, a strong and powerful state, but in some senses still a weak country and certainly a poor people. Now, what that means, whether that means it's a more or less benign China, we don't know. That doesn't mean we don't do anything. It means we try to manage risk, but that's a very different thing from trying to uh, predict the future uh, when it comes to China. Um, I think my, I'm on to my last uh, two seconds. I'll stop. Thank you, Nick. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Nick, and uh, uh, thanks uh, to Latrobe for organising uh, this event. Uh, delighted to be here this evening, and uh, I, I think my comments, uh, I'll try and uh, shape them more from the perspective of a practitioner uh, in managing the Australia-China relationship, although that's a few years now behind me, and in many ways the first two presentations are very good for providing the context and scene for what I want to say. Um, from a what was then a Canberra perspective in any case, uh, managing the Australia-China bilateral relationship uh, is very difficult. Uh, whether it needs to be difficult or not, I'm not so sure, but there are two uh, fundamental propositions that should guide the management of the relationship, uh, but don't really come together. One is uh, we need to be clear and recognise that uh, China which is obvious, is of overwhelming economic importance to Australia. But it goes beyond that because it's unlikely that any other country will replace China in that preeminent, uh, dominant economic relationship that it has with us. And that's um, uh, really just a result of the profound complementarities that exist between uh, the two economies. I saw Kim Beasley over the weekend was uh, running a line which I think Julie Bishop had picked up on a recent visit to Washington saying that, well, America was actually more important because of investment. But there, they're only talking about the stock of foreign investment. The growth, the flow, which is the appropriate measure, is um, uh, very much, uh, the trajectory is very much with China, and it's obvious that that will continue. So that's proposition number one, overwhelming and enduring economic importance for Australia beyond anything we've experienced in a single relationship um, in the post-war period at least, uh, and it's not going to change. If anything, the interdependence will get greater. John raised a question about, well, is that a good thing in the context of fear? Uh, there's not much we can do about it. We're not going to tell universities to stop taking Chinese students or um, uh, farmers selling farms to Chinese or uh, uh, exporting resources to China. That's just a, a, a result of the complementarity between the economies. The other element, and John, uh, I think, uh, very much highlighted that in his remarks, is that we have never had to deal with a country more different uh, than Australia that is of great economic importance to us. And therein is the problem policymakers in Canberra constantly struggle with. They would love uh, to maybe substitute India uh, for China because, well, the Indians speak English in a fashion, they have a sort of legal system, but the most important thing is Indians play cricket. So, you know, really, they're like us. But unfortunately, the world's not configured in that way. And that is, in a global sense, the big challenge uh, uh, of China. We haven't seen, uh, in modern times, perhaps ever, a major global power that has stood so far apart from the global norms of political and social organisation. 
There are many smaller countries, uh, you can think, name them, but they don't matter. But there is one country and one economy that has profound economic implications for the world, but uh, even more so disproportionately for Australia, that could not be more unlike us in values and in politics and social organisation. So um, it's very difficult, and, and uh, it's very difficult to to square those two um, those two propositions. And my time as ambassador was very much spent trying to say to Canberra, if you accept those two things are true, which I think unquestionably they are, uh, then you have to devote disproportionate resources to the Australia-China relationship. You have to put so much more effort into it. You have to have so many more uh, points of engagement. And I was delighted uh, Linda's comment about the United States because you know, people in Australia wring their hands and, and anguish about China-US relations. If, the, if there's one people who get China well, it's the United States. And the multi-layers and the depths of the engagement and the balance, ballast in that relationship makes me quite sanguine about the outlook uh, for that relationship. And it's partly because they're both great powers and great powers understand each other and Australia's not a great power. And great powers think about the world in very different ways than middle level uh, or small powers. Uh, China's also um, been a major disruptor. Uh, it came from nowhere as it were. 30 years is, 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 a, is a very small short period of time in terms of major changes in global um, uh, global uh, geopolitical and economic uh, organisation and weight. And uh, we are still digesting that, that, that massive disruption. And again, I come back to the point, because of those things, it, it behoves us to put that much more uh, effort and resources into the relationship. The sorts of things that we should be doing, and we need to be very careful that we don't just engage on a transactional basis, the greed, uh, if you like. Uh, this has to be a very, very broadly based uh, engagement and it needs to put a big effort, which we don't really do much at all, and we do much less so than say the Europeans, uh, in the cultural, education, scientific and research spaces. Uh, we, we are transactional largely in our approach. There are very good people, very good institutions uh, who try and, and plug some of the gaps, but there really isn't a well-defined and committed national uh, effort in this regard. The second part of my, my comments uh, are to reflect on how the new Prime Minister might approach um, the relationship because as Paul Keating often said, and he often doesn't tire of saying the same things over and over again, um, uh, when you change the leader, you change the country. So we've changed the leader and we really have a very different uh, uh, approach, I think, uh, will emerge in managing the relationship uh, with China. Uh, Turnbull clearly uh, understands contemporary China and partly for that reason he has no fear of uh, the China relationship. In fact, I noted his comment in his acceptance speech when he referred to technology as the great disruptor and that's, that should be seen as an opportunity, not something to be feared. And I, I think the same will apply to the way he thinks about China. Uh, in terms of opportunity, uh, aren't we lucky in Australia to be so deeply engaged? Aren't we lucky to have the opportunity to position ourselves with this, 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 this country, no matter how uh, different and at odds it stands to our own values. And he, of course, will be very true to his, uh, his uh, liberal uh, values. Um, I think um, uh, we'll see with Turnbull, uh, as I said, a very you know, pragmatic uh, approach to managing the relationship. Uh, the challenge for him, though, will be if he seeks to nuance uh, how we position ourselves between the United States and China. And therein, there is, a, I think, some very big risks for him. Uh, in particular, we have had a long period now where officials and ministers have tried to reassure the United States that there isn't a crack of light between us, that what is exactly the US interests are exactly uh, Australia's interests. And so he'll need to be extremely careful in managing, managing it. And I think, in fact, his biggest challenge will be the United States, if he wishes to reposition us, even to the smallest extent, uh, rather than China. And just finally, what would we want to achieve with this? And it is to uh, uh, do our bit to shape... Uh, oops, sorry, my time's up. Uh, <laughs> do our bit to shape how China engages with the region. One concrete example, we made a complete mess of 
China's attempt to build a regional institution, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. We could have joined at the outset, we could have had real influence and shaped that. Instead, we joined somewhere after uh, Finland, uh, somewhere after Norway and before, sorry, after Luxembourg and before Norway, hardly uh, well-recognised uh, uh, shapers of the Asia-Pacific region. I'll, I'll stop at that point, look forward to coming back to this discussion, but I think you won't get that sort of muddle under a, a Turnbull uh, Prime Ministership. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, Nick, thank you. One of the difficulties is that we've got people in Canberra in both the diplomatic service and around the Prime Minister's office who insist on seeing China through the eyes of Washing Washingtonians, through American eyes. And their view is very often that of the neoconservatives or the ultranationalists in America. We've got, to, we've got to adopt this as our starting point. A pragmatic policy with China based on Australian national interests. What are Australia's interests here? Australia's got interests. I, I caught this when I was in a forum at the ANU and Michael Thorley, who's the head of the Prime Minister's Department, was speaking. And he said, China won't help you produce a solution. China will get in the way or get out of the way. It's not willing or able to play a serious global leadership role. Quote, unquote. What's the point of that language? What's the point of that language? We've got diplomacy to enable you to express messages and send them to China. And here's the language I would have given him. I would have had him say in this forum, as head of the Prime Minister's Department, China doesn't aspire to be a global power because we were talking about America, American power in the world. China doesn't aspire to be the prime global power. Nobody looks to China as a substitute for the US. America sees itself as the indispensable nation, and that's the Australian perspective too. But we are heartened. We are heartened. Always praise. Praise is the language of diplomacy. We are heartened by signs of China enmeshing itself with the world order, like them sponsoring an Asian infrastructure investment bank. That's what we've told them to do. We've told them, be part of the world order. We sponsored them in to the World Trade Organization, and we admitted them to APEC, and we saw China decide not to be a revolutionary force, but to be part of the world order. Not to challenge institutions like APEC or the WTO, but to join them. That's what we wanted. That's what they're doing. And here they come along. They could have set up their own bank and said it's playing by Beijing rules and you can join it or not join it. But no, they said we're going to sponsor a bank for Asia that's going to meet Asian needs and will allow the nations that join it to draw up the rules exactly what we've been urging China to do. A responsible player, playing by international rules. Now the good thing is that the Abbott government, a big step for Tony Abbott, despite blandishments from the American president, he led Australia into it. Too late, it should have been instinctive, it would have been under Turnbull. But at least, at least, he had the wit to say, our interests on this something to do with China, may not be identical with America's perspective. That was a big step, but it was the right one. What is the Australian interest? And when you have the Secretary of the Prime Minister's Department addressing this issue, where's America going, America and world leadership, it was possible for him to use a form of words that encouraged China, spoke up the Chinese achievement, which has been extraordinary in the years since 1979, but also send a message to the Chinese because as a final paragraph, this is what I would have had Thorley say, President Xi knows that we are allies of the US, but taking seriously our partnership with his country, something that is easier for us when China adheres to the rules and avoids unilateral or abrupt behavior, especially in the South China Sea. So not for once am I advocating that we be craven or we cease to send diplomatic messages to the Chinese or about adhering to the rules, but there's a way of doing it. And talking about fear and greed like shirt-fronting Putin or talking about rat expletive, expletive deleted the Chinese, you know, Chinese rat expletive deleting us, this is, 
this is really not the language of a, of a mature country. Other countries make statements they later regret. China not accepted. A statement by a Chinese foreign minister in 2010, your small countries, we're a big country, would fit that same category. But my key message, we should see China through the eyes of Australian interests. And by the way, we're not the only American ally in this position. Let me list them. South Korea. President Park was at the military parade celebration in Beijing. America wasn't there, but President in a significant way, but President Park went as head of state. Germany has worked very hard on the China relationship. Chancellor Merkel goes there, I believe, once a year. Canada, well, as one small example, Canada didn't rush out in front of other of, of like-minded countries and hauled in the Chinese ambassador when the Chinese made an abrupt move in declaring a no-fly zone over the Senkaku Daoyu Islands. We did, but Canada, an ally of the US, thought we'll send our message through diplomatic means, not through a trumpet, not, 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 not through a, an amplifier. Uh, New Zealand, uh, my think tank has commissioned a study of New Zealand's China policy. Key message, New Zealand formulated a China policy based on New Zealand interests without reference to allies, Washington or Canberra, or any desire to stay in the zone of like-minded nations. They simply ask themselves, what is in New Zealand's interest? Singapore, I've explored Singapore's China policy. They have concerns about the expression of Chinese, assertive, Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea but they manage it very diplomatically, keeping their options open. Look, I think, I think we've got more influence in urging Chinese restraint in, in the South China Sea than we've ever had. The Americans have floated the idea of patrols in this region, quite possibly to test Chinese 12-mile claims around artificial islands on sometimes submerged coral reefs. We quite wisely, Canberra that is, under Abbott, to give him credit, have not said we would join such American patrols. As a result, I think we've got quite a bit of influence saying to Beijing, well, you know our position, we've got concerns, no unilateral behavior in South China Sea, but there's always that prospect of us joining America and maybe some other nation in patrolling and testing. We're not doing that but restraint by China would confirm us in that decision. That would count. That would count. I want us to keep our options open here. I don't want us to close the options. We don't know, I think Linda said this in her opening remarks, we don't know what the character of, of, of China's international personnel, we don't know what China's international personnel is going to be like in the years ahead. Sometimes the Chinese are unilateralist, and edgy, and anxious, and abrupt. Other times, I've instanced a few examples, they're playing by the rules. Bear in mind that China's not a revolutionary power, it's a status quo power. It plays by the rules of the Westphalian system. There's one revolutionary power in the world, if you exempt North Korea, and I suppose a few others, Venezuela perhaps, it is our great friend, the United States which, as a result of the Wilsonian impulses in its foreign policy, can send an army halfway around the world to rebuild a state, Afghanistan, or to remove a government, Iraq, or to give effect to a humanitarian intervention, miles from its shores. China doesn't preach that, and China hasn't got the power to deliver that. America has. China has not got the power to send its forces halfway around the world to change a government or the impulse anywhere in its foreign policy to do that. I conclude with this thought. Uh, if you look at our website, you'll find something that I think is very useful. I wrote it. Uh, I stand by every word in it. Um, you'd find it in the website uh, australiachinarelations.org. It's an account of China policy under the Abbott government. In the first three months of that government, there were a few a few hard-line remarks, and they may, uh, may have been missteps. Japan is our best friend in Asia. 
Well, you don't rank friends. It's not diplomacy to do so. Japan is our best friend in Asia. No need to say that. What you do when you go to Tokyo is say, Australia has no closer friend in Asia than Japan. You say the same thing when you go to Beijing or Jakarta or Singapore. Australia has no closer friend. You don't rank friends. Tony Abbott declared, apropos of nothing, and with complete inaccuracy, that we are an ally of Japan. And then called in the Chinese ambassador and announced we were doing so publicly to make a point over the abrupt Chinese move in the East China Sea. We didn't have to do it that way. But from 2014, the Abbott government remodulated. And it ran what I think is a pretty pragmatic policy on China. Uh, also on our website, you'll see an account of everything, everything Malcolm Turnbull has said about China in the last few years in, in summary form. And that confirms me in the view that his pragmatism would be somewhat more sure-footed and authentic. He wouldn't have delayed in the announcement we were joining the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. And implicit in that is a good thing. The recognition that we can run a pragmatic China policy based on Australian interests. And our perspective on this won't always be the same as that of our great and powerful friend, the United States. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, with that product placement, um, for which our students studying Australian foreign policy and uh, China and the world will be very grateful. Um, before we take questions from the uh, audience, I'll just pass, Linda wanted to quickly respond to something that Jeff said, and um, I'll just add one little footnote about scale. Uh, Bob mentioned that there are many countries that face Australia's dilemma of, sort of enormous economic opportunity and these question marks. There are 193 members of the United Nations. 123 of them have China as their number one two-way trade partner. So, Linda, quick response to, to Bob. Yes, uh, when Jeff was talking about how immensely important China is economically to Australia, while at the same time it is so different, the values are so different, one could put it bluntly, um, that it really is a government that we don't like. Um, and for that reason, we need this across the board, um, comprehensive engagement, you said. Um, I'd just like to bring one other dimension, and now I'm going to do what Bob did and, and talk about China Matters for one second. The reason I founded China Matters was to bring together these disparate groups within Australia who deal with China. Um, th those who are completely skeptics, um, who can only see the negative in China, and those who, again, don't want to see any of the real challenges that dealing with China um, entails. So not only does, and I agree with what Bob was saying, um, Australia need to think about its own national interests when it carves out its policy towards China, but Australia also needs to um, bring together these many different kinds of diverse voices. And perhaps I'd just add, not let the concerns be the overriding factor when we define our engagement and look at the, 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 the real, perhaps, risks of a deepening engagement, but also not just let what you were saying, the transactional, um, what money Australia gets from it. Um, so there's work to be done also within the various elites of Australia uh, when we think of our engagement with China. And that's why I founded China Matters. All right, we have, um, until 7.30, we have to finish promptly because our, a number of our panellists have to hightail it to the airport. Um, there is a roving mic. If I could ask you to ask a question or say something provocative, but please keep it short. There's liable to be lots of, um, well, we hope there'll be lots of interventions. Um, the light's a little tricky. I think Zara just here at the front. Zara Kimson from the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Um, Jeff, you said that uh, the US really gets China and Linda, you said that uh, there was a um, very a mature relationship over 90 official um, consultations during the year. I'm therefore, I'm getting sort of mixed messages about the American relationship and how, you know, it, it's a level above us and we have to sort of um, increase our, you know, improve our engagement. But why would it be that the American government opposed the, China, the Asian Development Bank and also tried to encourage some of its allies not to join it. Uh, I'm, I'm so, going to first yeah. crack at that if I may. Look, um, 
very good question. I, I'll tell you a little anecdote. I was participating in the Australia Canada Leadership Dialogue uh, a couple of months ago in Vancouver. Don't ask me why I got a Guernsey for it. I found myself there. But um, I happened to find myself at the concluding dinner with uh, Julie Bishop, the Australian Foreign Minister, and the Canadian Foreign Minister. And as you know, eventually Australia joined the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, but Canada never has. So as the questions were flagging and the evening was going on, I chucked the dead cat on the table and asked the following question to the two foreign ministers. Australia joined the AIIB. Canada didn't, who's right? Uh, which led to a long, um, uh, a, lo a lot of words, but no, no uh, enlightenment. Um, look, uh, there's a lot of things going on in, in the US, and, and my point's really about the, I think Linda's the same, the depth of engagement across the bilateral relationship. Um, I think the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, came from, the, sh the US should have seen it coming, they didn't. Um, but it seemed to be that this was the beginning of a, of, of a recasting, which it is, of, of the post-war global international architecture, financial architecture, economic architecture, all of which the Americans created in Bretton Woods. And they did it to destroy the British Empire and British imperial preferences. And so uh, America has great understanding of um, how these institutions can start to change uh, the global balance of power. So I think for them it became a very big strategic issue, not something in the bilateral relationship. I suppose I agree with everything you said in the beginning, but I don't know if they sat down and um, thought deeply about that it's a strategic decision. I saw it as a knee-jerk reaction which just got out of hand. Um, I w happened to be in DC at the time when this was all bubbling and both Democrats and Republicans on the Hill were completely united in discussions, I was there with Julie Bishop, um, that this was a complete blunder from the White House, it was the White House which was driving it. Uh, you're probably right that it was um, unconsciously, um, you know, this fear of the strategic consequences, mm -hmm. but I, I did see it as a knee-jerk reaction um, of where this might lead. In that sense, I do agree with Jeff. <clears throat> From my point of view, one of the most important things that's happened with regard to China recently is the signature of, not the signature, but the agreement with President Obama over climate change and the Chinese decision to enter the game and pledge some way to uh, cap its emissions by 2030. Um, what I've, I've seen different explanations of why that was done but I, I don't know whether anyone on the panel follows it, but I'd like to know what the Chinese motives were for that uh, agreement. So, John, do, why don't we start with John, and then if others, do you want to weigh in? I mean, my skepticism is not particular to China, it's particular to many countries that make these agreements. I mean, the Chinese own modelling told them that they would reach, reach peak urbanisation and, and also peak emissions by around 2030. Um, it was a very good way of making a commitment without really making a commitment. And since that announcement, I mean, things have been going on in China that are experimental and genuine in terms of lowering carbon emissions and various carbon, lowering carbon emission schemes. Um, but since that announcement, I don't detect any genuine environmental carbon reduction policy changes anyway. Um, that, that are linked to that 2030 um, um, commitment. I mean, you know, why they say 2030? Because they were told by their own modelling that's when it's going to peak, right? With, just by the slowing pace of urbanisation, etc. That's not in itself a terrible thing, I mean, but I don't think that that was the commitment beyond what you'd expect countries to make. So, Jeff, you just wanted to... Um, yeah, look, just uh, two points. I, I, I share... John scepticism, but it is the first time they, that it's a change of principle. They, in, in the past, they had a principle position that they would not agree to uh, a cap and reduction. And they said we were a developing country and there was a lot about developing country leadership. So in that sense, it's a change. Uh, but I agree with your scepticism, the date and everything is, 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 is within their comfort zone. There is a huge amount going on now and you see it affecting the Australian coal industry and, and others. Uh, 
to try and uh, uh, clean, clean up the place, and I think it's the government responding to middle class aspirations. But I just wanted to say, uh, um, Bob, you'll appreciate it. Um, what's fascinating is the timing of that announcement, that they made it um, uh, during the APEC leaders meeting, but it was made when Putin was in town. And I, I think I wrote somewhere that uh, uh, there was only uh, one person more unhappy than Tony Abbott with that announcement, and that was Putin. And I think there is very much there a, a, a message to Putin because all that year, China and, and, and Russia had been moving closer and closer together. Just a reminder that China will behave and ca can and will behave quite independently. Uh, thank you, panel. Uh, my name is Chan Su, and again, it was very insightful uh, comments from all panels. Um, this is more of an open question. Um, uh, just like uh, the ambassador said, you know, Australia and China has m not much in common. We don't play cricket. Um, I, had, I was very fortunate to travel with the NBL just last month to try to bridge the gap between the NBL and the Chinese Basketball League, CBA. Um, what is your opinion on sports, and do you see that as a good vehicle for not just social and economic relationships, but also as a form of, uh, uh, you can say, a new form of mining or wine industry? sports and entertainment? I, uh, I think it's rubbish. I, uh, I, uh, the argument against sport contributing to international understanding is the Berlin Olympics in 1936. <laughs> um, and I think Australia's got to be very careful of confirming the reputation that we're a sort of, sort of slow-thinking um, bunch of, of provincial idiots who can only get excited and motivated over games with balls and leaping into swimming pools and beating others, setting a record that will last 12 months before it's beaten by someone else who's more pumped up with the uh, chemically targeted... Uh, <laughs> I think the Olympic spirit's the word you're looking for, Bob. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we should... Uh, Australia should go through a phase in keeping with Malcolm Turnbull's comments the other, the other day where we talk innovation, and science, and scholarship, and learning, and arts, and leave sport off the list. A provocative statement to, an to a Melbourne audience, no less. <laughs> um, yes. um, a great panel. I was wondering if you could just comment on China's manoeuvring in the South China Sea. Uh, why do the reclamation now? <laughs> why be so overt? Why so obvious? Um, inside China, is this creating... Are they using it as a test, for example, of the response to this? In other words, is this going to encourage them to do other things? Is it a plan B if the economy doesn't go well for a nationalistic focus? Try and put in some sort of context as to why now in particular and why so overtly in your well, view. Well, we might start with Linda who's written extensively about China's maritime policy and then see what others have to add. Um, China's policies in the East China Sea um, under Xi Jinping have been quite different from the South China Sea. Uh, number one, we seem to have uh, several sources telling us that Xi Jinping has said he does not want bodies in the East China Sea. He recognizes Japan's military might in its own right, plus, of course, the U.S. Um, alliance factor. Um, it's also a rather small sea in that it's easier to control what happens there and manage what um, the Coast Guard of China is doing there and so on. South China Sea, it's a huge sea. There are several claimants. It's a very messy situation. Um, he has not given as strict orders there. He's, in fact, given quite ambiguous orders. Um, we must defend sovereignty, um, but we must maintain stability so we can um, trade and invest with our neighbors. I think he's sending messages. Um, first, he's definitely sending messages to the region that this is an issue that China is not going to back down on. Um, he wants to um, look tough. Um, he's certainly sending a message also uh, internally. Um, he is standing up for something that Hu Jintao didn't, um, his predecessor. Um, one has to remember that the word contradiction in China, um, in Chinese, is not an overtly negative word. It doesn't have that negative connotation that it um, often does in Western languages. It's, it's made up of the character sword and shield, what happens when the world's sharpest sword meets the world's most strong shield. Uh, it's a contradiction. Um, so while he's wooing the neighbors for all the 
economic benefit, political benefit that he can. He is going to, I think, remain very tough um, on this question of what China perceives as its maritime rights and maritime interests. Um, the reclamation um, work that's been going on, I mean, I think it was planned already in the late Fu Jintao era, but Xi Jinping has obviously um, given the nod that it can happen. John, did you want to? Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, it goes back to the size and scale thing. You know, as I mentioned, Vietnam and the Philippines uh, last century were in there before China. The difference that China has just this capacity to yeah. do it in such a scale that it's alarming, whereas what Vietnam and Philippines did isn't alarming. So, first of all, th there's a scale issue which the Chinese can do largely because they're a much more powerful and bigger country. But what is their strategy? I mean, interestingly, uh, the, pres the current president was head of um, the small leading group on foreign affairs under the Hu Jintao era that came up with the idea of the so-called salami slicing that you kind of push, but you don't push so far that you provoke a military response. And look, to be honest with you, if I was in a position of the Chinese and I thought or I had pressures on me to make good my claim to sovereignty that have, I think have, uh, in some senses, not out of control, but they're, they're difficult to manage domestically, I would be doing the same. I mean, really, what's the cost to you if you hold the island or the reclaimed island it's much harder to get you off. Down the line, you have a much better legal claim once you've held it for, mm. for a couple of decades. So if you sit in their shoes, look, I'm, I'm very, I am personally alarmed by it, but if I sit in their shoes, I'd be doing exactly the same. Mm. You know, if I could editorialise, I think the other issue is something that Linda really opened with, is this uncertainty. Um, China's never officially made clear what it is claiming in the South China Sea. There's this map with dashes on it that is literally that. Um, there is a whole range of actions from which one can infer what they're doing, and it's quite a deliberate strategy of ambiguity about what they're doing, um, but it's got all these layers, administrative, policing, pouring sand and concrete just happens to be one of them, and it has all these other consequences. So it's, it, it, it is symptomatic, I think, of the larger um, themes that the, the panel's been exploring. Now, sorry, sorry Jeff, go I, 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 But there is an element to this. Where it, it's not costless for China. Uh, China had for a long time uh, cultivated its relations with ASEAN and uh, in many ways people five or six years ago, analysts five or six years ago, maybe a bit longer, and I remember the Lowy wrote on this, gee, maybe ten years ago, um, uh, Milton Osborne wrote something that basically China was stitching up Southeast Asia and there was a real concern that it was uh, becoming the main sort of influence on the region uh, through very good uh, relations that have built painstakingly over many, many years. Suddenly you get to 2009 and there's this assertive diplomacy and Vietnam, the Philippines in particular completely pushed away from China, embraced the United States, wants greater US. In terms of China's strategic settings, this, this is uh, counterproductive and it's been very costly. Uh, I'm, I'm inclined, and I'd like maybe at another time to, 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 to tease out with, with John his what seems to be a sense that the end game here is some sort of uh, negotiation and that this period uh, is a period in which China is positioning itself, increasing its legitimacy, giving it weight. So at some point um, it will have, uh, uh, it will tilt the, the, the negotiating table more in its direction and that's why it's prepared in the short to medium term to pay the price in terms of its relations with ASEAN. Linda, quick. Two finger. It's exactly what a very senior official said to me. Xi Jinping's goal is to leave office so that he can say that I have cleared the table for a good uh -huh. negotiation for my predecessor. Right. It's not a question that he thinks that China is going to take any islands that it doesn't now occupy or do anything too dramatical. Mm. He wants to put China into a position that is a good negotiating. Um, starting point. That's what oh, um, interesting. has been said to me. Okay, at the back left up there. Hi, um, my name's Rebecca. I'm a La Trobe student studying social work. So my question is, um, I guess, about young people's um, future possibility and um, the free trade agreement that's going to happen. So, <laughs> sorry, I'll try and make my point as succinctly as I can. Um, so I know our economic 
uh, system is tied up very much with exporting to China. As they slow down, that is obviously affecting our um, economy. Um, as we have rising unemployment, would the free trade agreement help that or hinder that? Oh, if I that's clear. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think that's, I mean, I'm surprised it took that long to get to the free trade agreement. <laughs> so, um, John, why don't you start with that, uh, John and Jeff, and then see yeah. Bob and... I mean, it, it's hard to see why it would hinder, but I mean, my, look, I, you know, like most people, am fairly strongly supportive of signing this free trade agreement. But I also point out that, and once again, this is not particular to China, particularly the many free trade agreements with Asian countries, um, and that is that they tend to lower tariffs, but they tend to erect a lot of regulatory and other, um, other obstacles um, to, to prevent you from, from really accessing the economy. So the free trade agreement is clearly a, a good step, um, but it's really not the end of the story in terms of accessing the Chinese market. I actually think Jeff may or may not disagree, but his business deals a lot <laughs> with that. So he may be well placed to, to talk about that. And, and Jeff also was in office when, it, when it just, the talks began. Yeah, well, the, the product boardings I actually initiated the FTA. It was my idea originally. I went to Downer, um, and Downer went to, to Howard back in 2003, and we did it basically as soon as we'd done the FTA with the United States. And it was part of you know, a, a bigger picture. Uh, we were then the first developed country to go to China and talk about an FTA. It took two years just to get them to agree to start an unbelievable uh, sort of negotiations, including giving China market economy status, which caused huge controversy, some of you may remember. Uh, but it really was just about a technical issue inside the WTO's anti-dumping countervailing duties agreement uh, to, to deal with how you measure uh, a dumping or not. And it was purely a technical issue, but it was called market economy status, so people thought we were making some declaration about China being a market economy. It was far further away from that then than it is today. Um, but uh, in the end, you know, the, the, we were very slow in the negotiations for various reasons. We ourselves became very ideological about it. And um, I remember Bo Xi Lai, uh, after some lengthy negotiations with Mark Vale, describing Mark Vale as uh, uh, bookish and stubborn. Uh, the first adjective I don't think would rush, uh, rush to your mind in the context of Mark Vale, but uh, stubborn he was and subsequent negotiators were. Look, I think we have a very good agreement. It's better uh, than I thought when I left office, and it's better because not only does it level the, the playing field with our competitors, because we've suffered for many years now, because others followed us in, um, uh, competitive disadvantage in agriculture, particularly in, in sheep meat, wool, uh, wine, dairy, uh, with New Zealand and uh, Chile who have duty-free access. So this now levels the playing field and gives us uh, uh, the same uh, competitive uh, standing in the market. But it also has services, and we always had services as an objective, but um, it looked like we would never get services, and we have now. I think, you know, that it's not massive, and, 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 and John's right, I mean, there's all sorts of behind the border uh, 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 regulatory issues that, that mean these things don't actually, in, that mean these things, these things in practice aren't actually as good as they look in the headlines. Uh, but it is, we are the first and only country China has included a services chapter with, in an FTA. Now, I'm sure Andrew Robb and his team are fabulous negotiators, but I think there's a very interesting insight into what's happening in China and that is they're using the FTA to partly push forward their domestic reform agenda. And the key area now of domestic reform is services, particularly financial services, and we have elements of financial services in this agreement. It's very much like what Jurongji did in the early 2000s with the WTO entry. They used their WTO agreements to force the pace of domestic economic reform. Uh, to overcome domestic political obstacles uh, to reform. Um, and I think we're seeing it in a small version in our FTA with China. So I think, by and large, it's a very good, uh, it's a very good thing. Bob, did you want to just quickly add something? Yeah, yeah, the issue now in Australian politics has reduced itself to the question of whether the, whether, whether the Australian Parliament should legislate to mandate labour market testing before any... Chinese labour can arrive in the country. 
Now, the dangerous point about that suggestion is that we haven't got a legislative requirement associated with the FTA is that we concluded with Thailand, Japan, South Korea, the United States, or Japan. So the Chinese would be getting the message, we're only concerned about your labor arriving here. In fact, the chances of an Australian company going to China to recruit a tradesperson are negligible because under the law, one, it has to be someone whose qualifications are recognised in Australia, and two, they're going to have to be paid Australian wages and conditions anyway. So why would anyone actually go to China to recruit the labour? Um, so this is, a, this is an odd thing to be fixated on, and it very possibly would provide the Chinese with an obligation to walk away from the FTA. <coughs> they could feel obliged to walk away from that kind of treatment by the Australian Parliament. And we should remember, this is my final point, we should remember that there's op opposition to the FTA in China, as one Chinese diplomat put to me last week, and I don't think she was exaggerating or, or gilding her argument. Um, if you're a Mongolian milk producer, or a cattle producer somewhere in China, you're giving up a great deal in this. Australian products are going to get into those supermarket shelves without tariffs. And that's a big step. From her point of view, China's giving up far more than Australia is giving up in terms of market access. Thanks, Bob. We've got one in the middle here. Hi. Um, it's quite a common pastime for people in uh, you know, Western nations to consider um, politics in other countries, not for our own interests, but for the sake of the interests of the people in those countries. And I know that I think some people, a lot of people in China sort of resent the political closeness with North Korea because of the way they treat their, their citizens. But I just wonder if uh, people think that there's a potential for the middle class in, in China to sort of develop this sort of more outward looking um, cosmopolitan sort of ethic of you know, considering you know, compassion for other, other people in other countries. Well, does anyone want to, I mean, this, is, this has long been a sort of debate that as, a, as countries become more middle class, but as they become more globally engaged, as they send more and more of their citizens abroad to study at universities like La Trobe, do they then come back and question the values, particularly the political values of the society they return to? Um, does anyone want to pitch in on I thoughts? can take a stab. Um, if we talk first about just um, what Nick was saying, I would definitely say that the middle class um, in China has come to the realization that the quality of life for them, um, even though now they fulfill the criteria of being a middle class citizen in many ways, owning a house, having a college education, and what's the third one? Owning a car? car. Yeah. yeah. Um, they, they fill those criteria, but the quality of life is never going to be what they see when they go to Australia, the United States, Canada, Europe on a holiday, and they all regularly take holidays with the whole family in these countries. So there is a realization uh, because of a number of factors um, that they're not going to breathe clean air, drink clean water, and, and um, have the space in the cities um, that most Westerners have. Now, when you come to political values, they're absolutely against the corruption. They want transparency, they want accountability. But are they going to um, rock the boat like that theory that, that a certain level of income the middle class people start to demand democracy. I, and it, I think it's a too long a discussion for this evening, don't believe that the Chinese middle class is going to, in the foreseeable future, demand those political values, though they are um, very much um, dissatisfied, disgruntled about social injustices. What they're seeking is this fairness in society. They're, they're seeking what we would call a rule of law much more than the political values um, that our country stand for. John. Just very quickly, I mean, once again, this is very anecdotal, but um, if, if you think about what makes democracies good, in, in our view, you know, it's, it's those things, transparency, justice, access to, to courts, etc. cetera. Um, but you need institutions for that to happen. 
I mean, you need prior institutions. You need, it's not just property rights, but you need independent courts, <coughs> independent administrators, independent bureaucrats, etc. cetera. Um, China doesn't have those institutions. So if you, if you talk to many people in China who, who understand these issues, they'll tell you that democracy, one person, one vote, may actually mean chaos. It may not necessarily mean accountability or transparency, all those things that you normally associate with a democracy. Um, so if those institutions don't exist, um, and the middle classes, yes, they do want to get out of China, but I think they also understand that the alternative to the political system they have right now uh, could be a lot worse if it suddenly uh, changed abruptly. Very, very interesting that uh, China has become the first marxist leninist society in the world to enable its people to travel beyond its borders. Nowhere in Eastern Europe was that ever embarked on, and Cubans were not able to travel abroad. Mm. The state went to a lot of trouble to see that they couldn't. One standout fact about China is that 100 million Chinese each and every year travel outside the country. It's tourists, business people, students, 100 million a year. Now, it's an extraordinarily high figure. Um, and I don't know, like, like my, my other panellists here, I don't know what this leads to. I just don't know. They see, they see viable democracies where political power is contested. Are they going to go on believing that's not an option within their society? I don't know. The transitions that I think are of interest here are South Korea, which had dictatorial governments, authoritarian or militaristic governments. Uh, Singapore, of course, we know about the transition of the People's Action Party. There's just been a contested election in Singapore. Um, and one that's not often added to the list is that in Taiwan. We saw a, we've seen a political evolution in Taiwan over the last, what is it, 30 to 40 years, when Chiang Kai-shek's son decided there would be a contestable election. It's a big transition when a governing political party with a monopoly of political power, like, like the People's Action Party in Singapore, can say, well, we commit ourselves to an election, we're going to fight hard to win it, but we're really implicitly living with a situation where this election or the one after or the one after that, we may lose office, and as in Taiwan or as in South Korea, do a stint in opposition before we get back into government. One of the reasons watching China is so fascinating, I guess, to each of us on this panel, is that we don't know where this narrative is going to lead. We simply don't know. I will make a comment. Please, no, go for it, Jeff. Uh, I, I agree very much with that last, uh, that last uh, comment by Bob, but this is completely intuitive. Uh, there's no science to it. But my sense is that what you're seeing in China is just a reversion back to very old and ancient forms of political and social organisation. Um, and that these labels of Marxism, Leninism, let's face it, they're, they're an anachronistic, archaic badges from the 19th century in Europe that don't have any basis in China whatsoever. They've just been stuck on. They use those labels now. They mean nothing at all. They have no content whatsoever. But, but uh, you know, this is how China has been, been governed uh, for a very long time, and I suspect most people understand that and are uh, reasonably comfortable with it. Do, do, you remember, do you remember Henry Kissinger's book on China, mm. where he gives a, a very humorous account of how in the 1990s, Nancy Pelosi, as the leader of the Democrats in the House of Representatives, was saying, well, when it comes to fixing up relations with China, we've got to insist on complete freedom of speech, complete freedom of, of, of the press, and then we'll go on from there, getting other gains year by year. And Henry Kissinger remarked, this showed a lot of optimism about a political system that had never seen freedom of expression in its 4,000 years of recorded history. Mm. Uh, the, the, uh, just uh, a little bit of humour towards quick, the end. Quick, quick. <laughs> quick bit of humour, but uh, Bob's point about movement reminds me of when uh, Jimmy Carter first went to Beijing in about 1976 or 77, he was reading the riot act of Deng Xiaoping about uh, how uh, the people are in prison inside China and can't get out. And Deng Xiaoping said, well, uh, how many hundred million do you want? Yeah. <laughs> You'll have them tomorrow.
Yeah, although the, the, the thing about travel, I mean, it's, yes, Chinese people can go abroad, but they still find it extraordinarily difficult to move between cities. So there's that freedom of movement inside the country, which is, which is a, a big challenge. So in the middle, I think Georgina's been very patient, so. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Uh, Georgina Downer from AsiaLink. I wanted to pick up on um, something that Linda mentioned about the flashpoint really being US-Japan relations and then pick up on Bob's comment about... China-Japan. Sorry, thank you. China-Japan <laughs> China, Japan being a flashpoint. And Bob's comment about um, Australia misstepping or Tony Abbott misstepping, saying that uh, Japan was Australia's best friend in Asia. I'd be interested in uh, John and Jeff's comments on how, how should we... Uh, how should we as a country then play Australia-Japan relations vis-à-vis -vis China, vis-à-vis -vis the US? Who wants to go? John? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it, my response will come back also to, to Bob's initial remarks when he started and, you know, urging a, a more pragmatic policy when it came to China and quite correctly saying that our interests with the US don't always align and presumably with other like-minded Asian allies clearly always don't align time. But part of our problem in Australia is that often we join wars with America not because we want to, because we're managing the alliance, right? Because the, one of the strategic, or perhaps the biggest strategic disaster for us, for Australia, would be the end of the alliance and all that entails and all that we gain from that alliance. The sec second part is, and, and a broader picture, strategic picture, I think, in East Asia is that, you know, at in, on, in question is the sustainability of the American-centric alliance system. And Australia, like Japan, is very desperate to ensure that the alliance system can sustain. It's not there to overtly contain China, but it's an effective check or hedge if things go south, go, go, go bad. So that's a problem that often we will um, have, we will, we will um, agree to things with countries uh, in, in our region or with America, not because necessarily we actually agree in substance, but because we're actually managing a great alliance structure or greater set of strategic relationships, or we're trying to stop the perception that the alliance system is being degraded or whatever the case may be. So back to your question with Japan, I mean, you know, the, look, Abbott was, should not have called Japan our best friend in Asia, but in my view, what Abbott wanted to achieve um, was, and I have no inside information on this, but it seems to me what he wanted to achieve was to help bring Japan into a broader strategic picture and role uh, on the basis that this would strengthen the network, the US-centric network of security alliances uh, in the region for that uh, purpose of, of keeping a check in China. So, you know, with, with Japan, um, Japan is really uh, the only other country outside China that has formidable military and strategic weight. Um, if we do think, and I personally think, that the alliance system needs to continue, adapt, but continue in some form as a hedge, then Japan is an essential part of that, and the Australia-Japan relationship uh, is a central sub-part of that alliance structure. Now, of course, <laughs> diplomatically, we can manage things with China better and explain it better um, than has been done by, well, the Abbott government, but, um, but I'm not fundamentally opposed to what has occurred uh, with the Japan relationship um, by the Abbott government. Linda. I guess this is where John and I perhaps see the situation differently. I would agree with him that the alliance system is paramount um, for Australia's security interests, but I think it is not in Australia's interests to um, bring Japan into the fold any more than it would to do something with China at the detriment of the Australia-Japan relationship. I think on this very complex and, and heated and fiery issue, it's really in Australia's interest to do neither. A very quick response. Look, Australia should not be involved in the East China Sea, don't get me wrong. But should Australia buy Japanese submarines, if it's warranted, yes for those strategic reasons that I mentioned. Um, but maybe we half agree and half disagree. Yeah, because Australia I think we should, should not buy be involved in Japanese China Sea. It is not our interest to do so. I have a bit of a, a, a hesitation about the, the submarines, John, only because yeah. 
I mean, the symbolism yes. is, mm. is, 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 is a little extreme. Yeah. And when it comes from after the Prime Minister's uh, saying, or former Prime Minister saying, we admire the Japanese troops in the war, uh, we have no better friend. The submariners in particular. The submariners, we have no better friend than, the, <coughs> than Japan, and then we, we are going to have submariner, we're going to have a submarine. What I'd like to say, though, just in addition that hasn't been said, is that what we mustn't do is get into any space that China can interpret as containment. <coughs> and uh, Abe, before he was elected the first time round back in 2006, wrote a book uh, that, that envisaged the, the coalition of democracies, or the five uh, the democracies in the region. And China went absolutely nuts when Abe got elected. He lent on, um, on uh, the Bush administration. Uh, uh, they bought in on it. Uh, India, Australia, uh, and, and the Chinese just saw this as pure containment, bringing you know, Cold War ideological division into Northeast Asia. Um, now, it all fell apart uh, when Howard uh, was defeated and then, then uh, Bush, uh, but there's a flirtation, or there has been a flirtation with that as well. It's, it's developing a mature understanding of, of, of hedging, and I think the alliance relationships are extremely important to that but not then going the next step to having some ideologically formed group called the Coalition of Democracies. I used to ask, I was that Deputy Secretary at the time, very much opposed to this, but lost the argument. If it was truly a Coalition of Democracies, why wasn't South Korea included? Well, we know the answer, because of Japan. Yeah, the arc of freedom and democracy well, I think, was, I think, was I think disjointed. Just on, just on this very briefly, we've got more influence in urging restraint on Japan and on China about their behaviour in the East China Sea if we're seen by both of them as being scrupulously neutral. We've just got more influence. There is a body of opinion in Canberra, you probably dealt with these people when you were there, who are drawn to the idea of, of on ideological grounds of Australia getting measurably closer to Japan in a way that sends a message to China. In fact, I was told when I was minister that somewhere in the city, somewhere in Canberra, there is a draft treaty with Japan with ANZUS-style clauses in it yeah. in someone's bottom drawer. And I said, well, we need to find the nearest incinerator <laughs> and take care of that. But, but as someone who admires Japan and thinks we have got a commonality of interest, um, I think it is overwhelmingly in our interest to let it be known at every point we are not taking sides, we're not moving measurably closer to Japan in their dispute with China. From that vantage point, we can have more influence in urging restraint on both of them, on both of them. I'm serious about that being a message for both of them. On the subs, I'd, I'd be saying, we're entitled as a sovereign nation to buy submarines from whoever, wh whatever consortium is offering us the best deal, the best subs at the best price. But it is important that choice emerge from a serious competitive bidding effort because if it looks like a gesture, a strategic gesture, there's only one interpretation the Chinese will put on that. Yeah. All right, very last one in the middle there. I think you've got the microphone already. If you could keep it short and sharp. Thank you. Um, my name is Basil Dimitriou. I wonder if the panel thinks that China is aspiring in the medium term uh, to become a global, a global hegemon, um, ally of the United States, or is that too late because there's just too many other powers around? Not remotely, I would say. Not remotely. No. 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 There we have it. <laughs> Unanimous. <laughs> On that note, uh, please join me in thanking our panellists, for, particularly for the brevity of their last response. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. just like to extend some thanks. Um, as you all know, events like these do not happen by themselves. Um, I'd like to extend my thanks to the Latrobe Asia team and in particular to our administrative maestro, Diana Heatherich, for her remarkable work and tireless efforts in making today such a great success. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Robert Mann and the Latrobe University Ideas and Societies Program, uh, in particular, Benita Walton, Craig Costa and Leah Humphreys. Uh, as well as the excellent staff here at the National Gallery of Victoria. I'd particularly like to thank uh, Jane Long, our Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor, who suggested bringing our two teams together to work on China.
Um, and of course, I'd like to especially thank our panelists um, who have taken time out of their extremely packed diaries to take part in tonight's program. Finally, it remains for me to thank you, the audience, for being here on a typically schizophrenic Melbourne evening. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming uh, and enjoy your evening.